Greetings, all you fearfully wonderful. It's Jolololums, and welcome to my final summary and review of Somnophobia, the tales from the Pizzaplex. Here we explore what insights and contributions the books might just make to the wider lore of Five Nights at Freddy's. Our final story from this installment is called Clathrophobia, and in this story, Ballora makes an appearance. However, there's not quite a focus on her in this story as there is in the main character, but stick around, because this book has convinced me 83% that Fazbear Entertainment itself isn't just covering up ghost stories, but is involved in spectral research. We begin with an overwhelmingly detailed prologue of four kids hanging out together at the exciting Pizzaplex. Girl 1 wanted to go to Attraction X, but no. Girl 2 insisted on Attraction Y. Bickering in shoes, they rotate their fast around as they fumble their way around the Pizzaplex, past the roleplay auditorium, which I covered in a video pressure and which also proves that these stories are happening in a single universe and thus that the occurrence of the supernatural is canon to the books. They fumble around past more attractions. Fumble, 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 but then... Something happens. Boy 1 and Boy 2 want to go to a different attraction, Z, and the bickering perpetuates. Bicker, bicker, fumble, fumble. But what's this? They peer into their phasm map and realize a contradiction. The map's legend index reads an attraction labeled Ballora's Fitness and Flex. But the location appears nowhere on the map. Very strange. And the prologue. <laughs> Cut to a few months earlier, our protagonist today is Grady, a gamer, a Fazbear's technician, and a sufferer of claythrophobia. Claythrophobia? He and his two technician buddies, Ronan and Tate, are just finishing up their maintenance checklists of various machinery around the Pizzaplex small construction site. Ronan and Tate are eager to leave, seeing as their work hours are over, but Grady wants to finish all his quota so that he won't have to show up over the weekend. But one problem. Fazbear employee guidelines mandate a buddy system, meaning that the technicians must always be accompanied by at least another during work hours. Almost as if Fazbear is aware of a particular history and is trying to- But that's just a baseless conspiracy theory. Now, Grady insists he wants to get stuff done, but Ronan is principled and unwilling to break protocol. However, he also has this urgent knitting party to attend to at home. A very sweet man. Grady encourages him to attend to that. Despite Ronan's crippling hesitancy, he eventually lets him be, trusting in Grady's assurance of carefulness. Tate, meanwhile, doesn't really care. He's a free spirit, impertinent, self-centered, childish. He's just- You're either perfect, or you're not me. Ugh, one of those co-workers. The two leave. Grady heads around, attraction to attraction, clearing his checklists and tweaking machine settings and whatnot. His papers highlight some testing requests for Ballora's fitness and flex site. This was a fitness attraction housing a tall labyrinth of tubes, snaking their way downwards at 90 degree angles. The intended objective was for participants to start at the top and make their way downward by contorting themselves to slip through the increasingly narrow tubes. Eager to head home to a weekend of elite gaming, he climbs a ladder to the top and starts to squiggle down. It started off okay, certainly got his blood pumping, but as he descended, the tubes narrowed up, requiring greater wiggling and exertion, so that when he eventually made it to a checkpoint one third of the way down the pipes, his body was already spent. Ballora joins him as he catches his breath. I encourage you to slide on in. That's the best way to begin. She gracefully emerges from a hole in the platform he was on. The robot consisted of an upper body attached to what I assumed to be a sliding mechanism that allowed her to move through the tubes. I'm here to make sure you don't get stuck. This encouragement discourages Grady, seeing as this was the one thing he was trying not to think about. He already wants to back out, but alas, the checkpoint contained no alternative exits. He motivates himself, thinking once again on the exciting weekend of FNAF, UCN, any percent speedrunning. Makes mental notes about a few design flaws, like pipe cleaning in the case of sweaty people such as himself, as well as an instructional pamphlet on how best to navigate the tubes. And then descends. But then gets stuck. Whoops. A tube he was traversing was narrower than he thought it would be, and with the position he was in, he could not shimmy forth or shimmy out. His panic quickens, and sweat uncontrollably gushes out. Eventually he starts to call out, but obviously nobody came. It was after hours after all. Melora, he called. Help, I want out. Help me! Don't give up now. You can do it. Twisting through the tunnels is good for I'm feet. stuck. 
I'm so very happy to help you. I'm here to get you through. She reaches out her hand and receives Grady's hesitant own. Allura yanks into the tubes at an alarming speed, stretching his joints with every rhythmic tug. That hurts, he exclaims, but Melora ignores him, dragging him past the 90 degree turns like an elegant eagle, an eagle carrying a blimp. Stop, he shrieks, just stop it. Grady's muscles burn within, he moans at them, tearing away. Nausea seeps in, he closes his eyes, he breaks his teeth and just breathes as steadily as he could. It's all he could do, Melora just would not let go. Surely the contorting and stretching would stop, surely. Ballora lets go and Grady clutches himself inside the second checkpoint cubicle. Sobbing bitterly, he rubs his shoulders and rocks himself softly, pressing his sore back against the cubicle's walls. Unfortunately, this checkpoint also provided no alternative exit out of the structure. He surrenders and sits still, hoping for his colleagues to come and find him in the morning. He makes jokes to himself as tears and sweat drench him, massaging himself some more. Grady's parents weren't neglectful. They just lacked discernment. Grady's babysitter wasn't available that evening. In an urgent haste, they opted to hire a brand new one based on recommendation. Then Francis came in, sweet and innocent enough, smiling and humoring the young Grady with his toys. As soon as his parents had left, she called her boyfriend over. Cute little Grady, trying to scrape peanut butter off of the roof of his mouth, waddled over to the living room where the two emerged hand in hand. Grady in retrospect thought it strange how much this boy resembled his jerk colleague Tate, even down to his cocky demeanor. They then started snogging, yes, in front of the bebe. Francis attempted to preserve a sense of decorum by shyly pushing the boy away. The boy realized her concern, turned to Grady and asked if he wanted to play hide and seek. Grady, too jovial to allow suspicion, inclined. The boy walked through the house, opening and closing doors, seemingly looking for something. Grady grew mildly concerned, but when he returned to him, taking his hand and leading the confused Bebe out of the living room, he suppressed his suspicions once again. Perhaps he thought to just think of all the fun they were going to have. They walked down the hall to a linen closet. It wasn't terribly small, in fact the bottom shelf seemed spacious enough to fit a child. Grady banged against the door. He tried to reach the closet doorknob as he called out, and nobody came. He called out again, trying to better fit his arm through the space between the bottom shelf and the closet door in order to reach the doorknob. Still, none responded, and the doorknob was too far up. Soon he overreached and got his arm stuck in the gap. Then the screaming broke out, but nobody came. He pulled and pulled, scraping his arm, but it didn't do much. He pulled harder between the guttural bouts of fear, spraining his wrist in the process. Still, it was no use. Alas. Trapped in the darkness of the closet, an hour sauntered slowly by. His throat hurt too much to continue. He sat feeling the tears and snot staining his face. As he struggled to breathe, he decided to focus on a faint glow from the minute hand of his watch to help him keep track of time. The minute hand did another full cycle. Smelling the laundry's fragrance reminiscent of his mother created an odd dissonance in the child's brain. Something like his mother so near to him while in reality so far away. The minute hand did another revolution, then another, and another, and then once more. His parents opened the door to him, dazed and dehydrated, but hey, at least still alive. The therapy didn't seem to help much. His condition solidified and took a toll on everyone. Car rides were a nightmare, closing doors itself was a trigger. Grady's parents, assumedly from an overbearing guilt, were more lenient in getting Grady whatever candies, corn, or confectionaries he could ever wish for. This also helped cull his fears of closed door and tight spaces, but had a negative impact of junk food being a major method of escape for Grady. On this note, I hope you don't mind if I take an aside here. I really feel for this parental guilt of bringing up the youngins. I can only imagine the sting. But the hard truth to carry is that in some way parents do mess up their children. It's a consequence of the imperfect. I would at least want my parents to know that creating safe spaces for child development it's too monumental a task for just the two to take on. It takes the rest of the family and all sorts of other environmental factors too numerous to control and consider. I asked my own mama what she felt about this, and she pointed out that while it feels correct to spoil Grady in this way, it's actually a symptom of unforgiveness. 
Our encouragement is since the Lord himself forgives the contrite who receive him, that such parents should also let it go, forgive themselves and resume treating Grady the way they used to before. Anyways, now as Grady sits recovering with pain subdued, his cravings start to kick in, along with tears and sweat, triggers that leave him a sticky mess. It also occurs to him that once his co-workers hear about this, he'll be the talk of the century. He groans at the thought of humiliation. Hey y'all, come look at this! Could he really risk being teased over imminent danger? No! Against his better judgement, he convinces himself into working through the final set of teeth. Now to be fair, as he descended, he tried applying what he had learned hitherto. He practiced utmost care, moving only in tiny increments and executing a wagging snake-like movement. This way, you see, every movement would minimize the risk of getting his- Oh, who am I kidding? He got stuck. Good grievance says he got stuck. Let's move on. I'll stop wasting your time. Realizing he'd wedged himself too tightly again, he went slack and prepared to go to sleep. His employees would find him in the morning, he assumed. He squirmed a bit to check his circulation, sighed and then focused on slow breathing. I don't sense any downward movement. Do you need any help? He catches his breath and holds very, very still. He fears that verbal protests wouldn't matter given her previous disregard. Do you need my help? He quietly exhales. My senses indicate progress has stalled. Do you need my assistance? He inhales. I'm required to provide help to anyone who gets stuck. He exhales. Please, can I help? I want to help. I want to help. Go away! Grady screamed upon the Lord, clutching his curled up fists. I don't want your help! But it was no use. Melora yanked down, and an explosion of pain shot through I Grady. Down and down they went as Melora sang. It's just a little way to the end. I'll get you around every bend. Grady stretched and stretched. I want to help. His body slowly broke apart, the details of which I will now spare you. I want to help. Ronan was driving Tate home when he realized that he had left his keys at the pizza plex site. So they coincidentally did a U-turn and headed back. This annoyed Tate, who was late for his date by the lake with Kate. No, no, I'm kidding. Her name wasn't Kate. But anyways, he moaned and groaned as he dragged his feet through the parking lot to follow Ronan. They reached the locker rooms where Ronan found his keys. But instead of heading back, Tate suddenly insisted that they should instead focus on the thought and sight of Grady mushed and squeezed through those narrow tubes. LOL. How cool would it be to see that? Tuck your head, big guy. Breathe slow. Ronan buckled, the room spinning around him, and Tate set him down, comforting him. Just take a minute, Tate said uncharacteristically as he got up and walked nearer. Ronan couldn't look again. Is he alive? Not sure. It's hard to see whether he's breathing. Oh, oh man, I think I just saw him blink. Yeah, he did it again. He's alive. We, we have to call 911. What are you thinking? I, I'm thinking we need to get him out of here. We, 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 need, we need someone who can. We can't do that. What in the world do you mean? G give me my phone. I can't do that, dude. You don't get it. If we call someone, it's gonna come out that we left him in here alone. Totally against the rules. That's... that's what I said earlier! I know, I know. But no matter what you said, we left him, and this happened. If Grady survives, he would have no problem making a workers' comp claim. He might even be able to sue Fazbear Entertainment. If an injury is intentional, an employee or surviving family can sue. And intentional is defined as having certain knowledge an injury would occur, and willfully disregarding that knowledge. But... but Fazbear Entertainment couldn't have known for sure so someone would get Are in. you kidding me? Do you see the size of those lower tubes? No way a full-sized man could have made it through those. And yet, they wanted one of us to test it. They had to have known would get hurt. It wouldn't be hard to make a case. Okay, uh, fine. 
But that, that means they deserve to be sued. Why could we get him out? Grady's injuries are a liability nightmare. What do you think Fazbear is going to do with the two employees who left Grady here by himself to get stuck? And even if we argued that it would have happened anyway, we broke protocol and the result was disastrous. They would have clear grounds to fire us. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to get fired. Even so, we have to help him. He's... Yeah, I know, I know. But look at him. The minute anyone tries to move him, he's going to be in excruciating pain. And he'll bleed out before they can get him to the hospital. There's no way he can survive. But if he's, if he's blinking, it means he's conscious. Yeah, and... he's probably in horrible pain, I get it. But then again, maybe not. Look at how his spine is all screwed up. Maybe he's paralyzed. There's no way to tell. That blinking could just be a reflex or something. You really think so? I really do. This sucks the big one, it really does. But Grady might as well be dead. And anything we do to help him right now is gonna get us in really big trouble. There's no upside to us calling anyone. Not for Grady and not for us. He's gone, whether dead or soon to be. Maybe he wasn't even blinking. Maybe it was just a death spasm. And I bet he'll be the first one to say there's no point in us throwing away good jobs and maybe even our careers by letting anyone know we let him stay here. Grady, meanwhile, was in fact conscious during that intercourse. It's described that despite his severed spine, he could still feel everything. He just couldn't react. And he wouldn't have blamed them anyway. He needed this job just as bad. Ronan thought about his nice house and his lovely friends in the knitting club. He thought about all the luscious yarn he'd recently bought because his pay was so good. Did he want to give all that up? Tate gripped Ronan's arm. Listen, all we have to do is walk away. They're not tracking us. We'll just say that we all left at quitting time like usual. We didn't know about it. Ronan lifted his gaze and brought himself to look at Grady, his way of at least respecting a dying man before departure. Bye, Grady. Goodbye, Grady. He turns and the two leave him to the two leave him to die. That was a pretty good tale. It is sad that the book authors leave us once again with an awful ending. I feel like it gets a bit tiring to invest in characters you feel won't make it. But anyways, I believe we have some interesting tidbits to chew on. Firstly, I do like that we get to see this business from an average employee's eyes. Despite being so massive and successful, Fazbear Entertainment always felt so empty. And taking the conspiracy angle, where employee interactions lead to cover-up and corruption, makes it all the more fascinating. We get here in this story at least some explanation of the semblance of motivation around how death and tragedy gets overlooked in these mega corporations and how it's not just simply an issue from those at the top. Makes the world building feel a little more alive. And that ties in well into my next theory, revolving around Tate's insightful speech here. Quote, no way a full-size man can make it through those. And yet, they wanted one of us to test it. They had to have known would get hurt. This detail about intentional harm fascinates me because it seems to be a subtle but consistent occurrence that Fazbear Entertainment is more aware of the supernatural than one might expect. In my second video on Somniphobia Pressure, I surmised that this spiritual force called Agony somehow influenced them all and repeated fragmented events of the past and the present. And now I believe with this here, Tate's conspiracy theory, that we're being further pushed to suspect that Fazbear Entertainment themselves might have done some research into the supernatural. Let's lay some more thorough groundwork for this. Fazbear Frights took a surprisingly science fiction approach to the supernatural. Spoilers for these books, by the way. Most notably with Fetch, which laid a foundation for the concept of the power of intention, emotions, and their influence over reality. Here, the MC, Greg, feels called to an abandoned Fazbear restaurant. They're always getting abandoned. There, he finds this aged, evil-looking animatronic dog called Fetch. It was designed to communicate through the user's phone and fetch things for them upon request. The dog bot eventually activates, connecting to Greg's phone despite being dated technology, and then begins presumptuously fetching things for him. As the story proceeds, the dog bot starts mm, to get a little dark. 
shotgun doesn't shy away from dismembering or outright killing in order to retrieve. It's also very selective of which of Greg's intentions to execute, sometimes disobeying him completely. In any case, this is what he thinks he was guided to. He believes this guidance to be the influence of some pseudo-physical existence of happenstance, which he calls a field. A field that itself could be manipulated through intentions sent out to it. A kind of fate, if you will. Quote, he had had no idea Mr. Jacoby, his lecturer, was going to talk about this today. What were the odds? He grinned. They were no odds, they was just the field. Here you see he really wanted to learn about a particular topic and wouldn't you know it, the lecturer talked about it the next day. He attributes this to his intention. Anyways, another reason he believed in this calling was a part of his research on Cleve Baxter, a real-world former CIA interrogator who believed, quote, plants that had become attuned to a particular human being appeared to maintain that link wherever the person went and whatever he did. Baxter concluded, quote, there exists an as yet undefined primary perception in plant life that animal life termination can serve as a remotely located stimulus to demonstrate this perception capability. Mr. Baxter's contentious parapsychological research found that plants somehow linked to certain animals or humans would remotely perceive and react to said animal, most demonstrably through its death. And it's this attunement that Greg is trying to get to the bottom of through fetch. It certainly seemed to be reading Greg's mind to execute fetch requests as opposed to using his phone, but how so? Well, another concept explored in this book is the existence of random event generators. Quote, a random event generator is a machine designed to generate a random output and then turning the pulses into ones and zeros, which as you know is binary code. Researchers built the REGs as a way of studying the impact that focused thought has on events. Okay, okay, so what's all this setup lead up to? Well, isn't it interesting? If REGs were made for the purpose of intention, then isn't it curious that we also get hints that Fetch himself, a Fazbear Entertainment product, might have been an REG? Quote, too easy. What's too easy? AOTA. All of the above information was too easy? What did Fetch mean? Was he saying that Greg was making the field too easy? Then Fetch texted, REG M2. Fetch then texted a link to a website that sold small REGs. Greg didn't understand what Fetch meant by REG M2. Did M2 mean me too? Did that mean Fetch was saying he wanted an REG too? Or was he saying he was an REG? Or like an REG? Omega oh, oh, But let's cook further with this. In the epilogue of the third book, 1.35am, we have the scrawny fellow Mr. Phineas, a paranormal researcher collecting supposedly haunted objects and paraphernalia found at scenes of tragedy and death. Haunted, usually used as a word to refer to something embodied by a ghost, could mean showing signs of torment or some kind of mental anguish. And this was the more important definition of the word. These items on Phineas's shelves weren't possessed by ghosts. The ones that were truly haunted were energized by agony. Here's another quote. You see, I'm convinced that agony has a greater energetic radius and power than any other emotion. I have done numerous experiments to study the leftover emotion embedded into objects that were near a tragedy. My work is focused on my hypothesis that you can take a saturation of agony, add any kind of intelligence, even an artificial one, and they will combine together to transmute the energy of emotion into the energy of physical action. This, I believe, is what explains what people call haunted objects. I find the detail on artificial intelligence particularly striking, but let's first notice here the mention of saturation. Phineas believes low levels of emotion aren't enough to carry over into this physical action he describes, and is why he prefers buying items exposed to scenes of tragedy, where intense emotions like agony might be concerned. What's incredible is that this so-called physical action involves an almost complete mimicry of a human being. The book doesn't specify exactly what is meant by adding intelligence, but my interpretation is that it has something to do with the likeness of intelligence, namely obtaining something just humanoid enough for the leftover emotion to translate into human mimicry. Quote, he lifted the endoskeleton from the box. He hadn't expected it to be this broken. No matter. You see, it didn't matter to him because he depends on agony to supposedly get creative, perhaps, in figuring out how to get physical action from a broken endoskeleton. This is any artificial intelligence or robotic engineer's dream. To create something you don't even have to train or find working parts for. Heck, just do a good enough job, add in the semblance of intelligence, which again, I assume to be a likeness of an intelligent being, and voila, think of all the costs that would save. Do you catch my conspiratorial drift? Mm -hmm. And what's more, what if as opposed to finding objects speculated to be haunted like Phineas was doing, which may be time consuming and fraught with busts of false alarms, you just simply generated the agony needed for physical action. 
This leads us to Gumdrop Angel, the first story where I started to suspect something fishy brewing within Fazbear Entertainment itself. In the book, the MC Angel takes a gumdrop from a Fazbear restaurant joint that starts transforming her body into a gummy sweet itself. As she's transforming, she seeks help from a Fazbear employee, suspecting that they might know something of the strange phenomena happening to her. She barely manages to reach the entrance late at night, past closing hours. Her limbs were all awry, and her hearing, vision, and consciousness dimmed as her insides turned more goopy. The employee takes her in his arms and rushes her down to a remote part of the restaurant. Suddenly, Angel is able to hear and see again. Quote, like her hearing, her eyesight had miraculously cleared up. The employee then lowers her into a wooden box that seemingly resonates with and comforts her. Okay, Angel, I'm gonna put you in something that's gonna help you. Do you understand? As soon as she saw the box, Angel no longer cared about what was happening to her. She didn't need an explanation. She was where she was meant to be. She drifts off to sleep and a few hours later she awakens, now fully aware, and is lowered like a piñata onto a birthday party scene. You see, the tradition for kids' parties at this particular restaurant was the birthday gummy race, where a giant gummy person would hover over the children as they raced to take chunks and bites off it. The book implies that there were many victims turned into gummy humans and used for this tradition, and it ends with children chowing down on our poor MC, whom we know very much still possessed some sensory faculty. Quote, the sensation of being lowered stopped. She felt her body swaying back and forth. The main takeaway from this is that the employee was following a procedure, one that allowed her to feel and regain consciousness again, as opposed to just dying from a lack of her mm, original biology. But to what end? Instead of fixing her, they lowered Angel into the gummy race platform to be eaten alive. An agonizing experience, one might say. Is it just plain sadism? Or are they simply gathering leftover emotion behind these scenes? Another interesting point and probable catalyst of Angel's sensory restoration was the wooden box that the employee brought her to. This language sounds familiar to the Fetch story, where she was drawn to the box. Could Fazbear Entertainment have cracked the puzzle of attunement? And of course, we can't forget the incredible gumdrop elephant in the room. The very fact that Fazbear Entertainment was aware that the gumdrop candy could turn a human into said candy. The implications of their supernatural research are huge, and you'll see hints of this sprinkled around these tales. In the story Dance With Me, a girl called Casey, very interesting name, steals some goggles that allows one to see a hologram of Ballora. Exciting. She mentions the hologram being an impressive visual effect for such a cheap toy. Not only that, but the hologram of Ballora seemed to have a subtle effect on the real world. A pirouette from the ballerina, for instance, would cause nearby leaves to twirl around. Impressive. Now how did Fazbear Entertainment manage such technology? And now that you mention it, haven't we seen virtual things like holograms influencing the real world somewhere before? Hmm. But there are also other overarching themes, like assumed identity, all of which might tie into this strange reference in this story where Grady swears that the one who traumatized him in his childhood was almost exactly like a present-day co-worker Tate, a very odd detail that I'm not sure where to take. In any case, my suspicion is that the book authors are trying to get us to think a little more critically about Fazbear Entertainment themselves, their knowledge and utilization of the supernatural, as well as issues of identity and imposters. But that does it for this story, phew, one book finish. It was quite a challenge to balance production of this, but I had fun making this. I hope this was helpful for you, and cheers.